Cool. So thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, for waking up so early and coming to the Go Dev Room. Uh, so we're going to start, as we always start, with the, uh, the state of Go. We're going to be covering all of the things that have happened since Go 1.12, which is actually a bunch of things. Uh, I am Frances Campoy, uh, and I've, uh, here with, I'm here with Marche, Hi. which is uh, the co-organizer of the Dev Room. Without her, none of this would have been possible. So thank you. Uh, so what happened since Go 1.12? Go 1.13. Uh, also 1.14 eventually. <laughs> 1.12 was out in, uh, back in September. And 1.14 will be out sometime, hopefully February, but we still don't know. Beta 1 has been out for a while, so you could try it out. Beta 2, I think, will be coming out, but I'm not really sure about those plans. Uh, so we're going to be talking, as we always do, about all of the changes to the Go community, but also the language, the standard library, and the tooling. So. Without, uh, since we don't have that much time, let's go directly into what has changed to the language since Go, since Go 1.12. In the last time I did this talk, I had a very cute slide saying nothing, because uh, nothing has changed. Uh, this time, actually, we had things to say, which is new. So two things have changed. In Go 1.13, we got new number literals. And in Go 1.14, we uh, changed the way embedded interfaces work uh, slightly. So let's go with the number literals. So now you can use binaries. Yay, 0B101 is 5. Uh, but also you can use octals. We had octals already. 010 has always been, surprisingly to many people, 8, not 10. Uh, but now you can make it a little bit more clear by using 0O, uh, either upper or lowercase. Uh, in addition to that, you can also use imaginary numbers everywhere. So if you've always wished to use imaginary binary numbers, congratulations, now you can. Uh, <laughs> Hexadecimals have also evolved, uh, so now we have two, more th two new things to the hexadecimals. And I see weird faces, I know. So the goal of this is actually to make Go be more compatible with other languages, or rather make the numbers in Go similar to other languages. This is actually following a standard. I am not really sure personally in what use cases you would use this, but if you know about any, I'd be interested in knowing. Uh, so uh, the way this works is that we have floating points, and floating points, if you had 0.1 in decimal, it means that the one is divided by the base, 10. Here's the same, 0.1 in hexadecimal, you're dividing by the base, 16. So 0.1 is actually 1 16th. Uh, and then you have expon exponents, and those exponents multiply by 2 to the power of that exponent. Uh, so if you have something like a point C, P3, that is uh, a point C is 10, uh, which is multiplied by 1, the base 0, then plus 12, which is C, divided by 16, then you add that, then you multiply it by 2 divided to the power of 3, and then you get number 86. Write 86 if you have to. Uh, cool. Uh, also related to exponentials to the power of 2, we have shifts, and shifts have changed in a very slight way, but very useful actually. Previously, uh, you could only shift numbers by unsigned integers which means that if you had a not negative number, you would convert it to an, to an unsigned integer, have an overflow, get a different number which was wrong, and then do a shift by that. Now you don't need to do that conversion, which means that now you're able to say, I want to do a shift by minus two, and you will get a panic, uh, which is actually better than letting it work. So I think that there's a very, very good change slide, but you might get new panics. So there's a new panic in Go 1.13 that you might have never seen before. Uh, you can also separate numbers with underscores when they're very long, which might be a very good idea or a very bad idea, depending on how you use them. So, what can you do? You can have good ideas, like that is a million, and it's obviously a million. You don't need to count the zeros, so that's useful. You can also have dates, uh, which, by the way, I forgot the word. Polyandro. Poly what? Polyandro? No. No? Andro. No. Poly, poly something. Poly, what is the word that like, starts and begins the same way? Palindrome, there you palindrome. go. So today is a palindrome date <laughs> in all formats. Yeah, I know. Uh, so, and also you can use colors, bad ideas, 0x15p1, it's still 42, so just write 42. More bad ideas. Do not do this. <laughs> this is an actual number now, and it's like something 500 something imaginary. Do not do that. Uh, also, I think it's a bug, but you can put as many zeros in the exponent as you want. So this is actually a number, and it will parse, uh, which is a very bad idea. I think that's a bug, probably. So yeah. Uh, 
Cool, so that's for numbers. On the overlapping interfaces can be FN. What's new about that? So, previously, if you had this interface, this would not compile because both read closer and write closer have a method close that both return error. They're both exactly the same method, but they're from different interfaces. So these will not compile. You will get duplicate method close. Since Go 1.14, this actually works, but it only works when both methods have the same type. So this type, in this case, close doesn't get any parameters and returns an error. That's it, right? Uh, the question right away might be for people that are coming from more like object-oriented languages is, oh, what method are you using? Diamond problem. Uh, doesn't matter because these are interfaces, right? That is not really an issue. You, you just say that there's a method close. Uh, this works when the methods are exactly the same. If they're not exactly the same, like in here where my closer doesn't return an error, you will still get the now somehow weird error message duplicate method close, which means that they're actually not the same, which is weird. But whatever. Uh, okay, cool. So that is all of the changes to the language. And now we'll continue with standard library with Martin. Thank you. So this year we again have a lot of changes in the standard library, so let's get started. First we have uh, some breaking changes. Uh, first of all, the removal of SSLv3, which started in 1.13 and is completely gone in 1.14. Finally. You shouldn't have been using SSLv3 anyway, since it can be easily attacked using the so-called Poodle attack, which you can just use to intercept all traffic. That's a very creepy logo. <laughs> Also, a breaking change is that um, runtime go exit can no longer be aborted by a recursive panic recover, which I honestly think is a real bug, and it's just been fixed now. So in previous versions, you could use this code, which was you do a runtime go exit, and then into the first, you panic and recover, and then suddenly, your goroutine won't actually exit. In this case, it's the main goroutine, and it will just continue executing and printing. So we also have a lot of changes in CLS in Go. As we know, SSLv3 is gone. We also have a new addition to uh, the certificates authority parts in Go, which we will look for, uh, to fix a bug in Alpine 3.7. It will now look for slash SC slash SSL slash shirt dot PAM. However, you probably never noticed this was an issue because Alpine just puts a copy in the default location that Debian uses. Uh, for Docker users, you still do still need to do APK install CI certificates. What's also new in Go 1.13 is ED255.9 certificates. These are already very popular in SSH, and we're now adding them to TLS and HTTPS and so forth. The big advantage is that the public key is only 32 bytes long, and it is even faster than any RSA encryption. This also uses a publicly documented curve, unlike some modern encryptions that is probably influenced by the NSA, so this one is safe. Uh, the downside is no browser supports this yet, so Go is just early, maybe in 10 years. Uh, there's also a lot of improvements in uh, error handling in Go 1.13, especially error wrapping, checking error types, and checking error values. So what we have is this problem here. For example, I do read config, and I want to check if my config file actually gets the error or does it, does not, or it does not exist. So what we can, we can do is this. We can do error is equal to OS error, do, error not exists. However, when we add additional context in the read config, this test does no longer work. If we want to do more advanced checks, we will get very hacky code, which we don't like. So what is the solution? The solution is we can now wrap errors in Go. How do we do that? We use FMT error F, and we use the new percent sign W verb. So this is our read config from before. And we now check open config JSON. We check for an error. And now we can wrap this error. And we can say cannot open config JSON, then our verb. And this will actually wrap all the errors in there and will actually keep uh, the type from these errors. So before, you could wrap errors with percent sign V. And we will always get an error of type error string error. Now with wrap, we get error wrap error. With this type wrap error, we can continue and use helper functions from the errors library, and we can do errors.is. So this will actually unwrap all the errors that are inside and check if any of them is equal to OS error not exist. 
We can even take this further. For example, we're querying a database, and we want to check if we have a specific query error. We can use a new helper function, errors.s, which will check if our er any wrapped error is of the type query error and expose it to us. We also have something new in OS. We have OS user config there. This actually builds on top of a feature I didn't know about in um, Go 1.12, which was OS user home there. Who has ever here used OS user home there? Did anyone know about that? I we didn't know either out. until yesterday, so that's... <laughs> okay, it's useful. So this new user config builds on top of the home there, and it will look for the config directory for your local system. Uh, on Linux, it's a dollar sign home slash dot config, application support on any Mac or iOS Darwin-based system, and app data on Windows. And for hashing, it's for you. Thank you. So uh, there's a new package in the standard library that is really cool. It's uh, hash map hash. Yes. Uh, so hash map hash, it exposes the hashing mechanism, the hashing functions that maps using Go by default. So whenever you use maps in Go, this is the hash that is being used. Uh, it is new in Go 1.14, and uh, it is, I mean, it's used for maps, so it is very good for maps and things like maps and other things that look like maps. Uh, so it is the fastest thing in the Go standard library. Yay, which made me think directly. It's like the fact that they say in the standard library means that there's something faster outside. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> there's CSpay XX hash, uh, which is actually a, an implementation of the XX hashing algorithm, which is probably the fastest one I had seen so far. Uh, it is still way faster than uh, map hash too. Uh, I think that the reason for this is actually that hash inside of the standard library needs to satisfy interfaces, and that makes it slower, unfortunately. Uh, interestingly, I thought that we would be able to, so I work for this company called DGraph who have a, hashing, a caching thing called Ristretto where we use uh, this, this uh, hash. And we were using it in a very hacky way. And it turns out that is exactly what the standard library does. Uh, so <laughs> what they do is they expose through, uh, through Go link name, they're able to expose the runtime function that is actually using assembly directly into the standard library. And then they wrap it with interfaces and stuff, which makes it a little bit slower. Uh, in Ristretto, we do this, which is basically the same thing, but no interfaces. Uh, and it turns out that this code is 10 times faster than the one in the standard library. So I want to propose a bug. Hi, Carmen. So, <laughs> so I think that we could do much better. We could be 10 times faster. And for hashing functions, I think that fast is better than idiomatic. So let's go with testing. We also got two new improvements in testing this year. In 1.13, we got uh, reflect.e0. And in 1.14, we got uh, cleanups, finally, in testing and benchmarks. So the first is our reflect is 0 now we can do in Go, we can use reflect to then take a value of any variable and check if that value is equal to the zero type of a specific type. For example, integer, a zero is zero, true. An empty string is a default zero type of a string, so it's true. However, we have to be careful with slices since they're pointers. So here, an empty slice is false, but a nil slice is true because the nil is a, is a zero type of the pointer. We also have cleanup. So when we run test, we can now add t.cleanup, which will run on the end of the complete run of all your tests, and will clean up anything that you have done to make your test possible. How is this different from the fur? Well, that has to do with uh, when you use parallel tests and subtests, this might actually be more favorable over uh, the fur. So we also got two new improvements in time. We got two new functions on duration. We got uh, dot milliseconds and dot microseconds. As the name suggests, they return the integer value of the duration. The implementation is actually quite simple. It's just take the duration and divide it by 0, x, 1, f, well, f4, p, plus 0, 09, also better known as just the thousands. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> I have a tooling back to you. Cool, thank you. So, uh, tooling for Go. So. Go modules. Yeah, uh, I cannot not talk about Go modules, so we're gonna talk about Go modules. But unfortunately, there's way too much to say about Go modules. Uh, there's a lot of things that have changed, so I'm just gonna cover the most important changes. That said, uh, the whole theme is Go modules got much better, which is very good. Uh, so, Go 111 modules or Go 111 modules, depending on how you want to read it, 
When you set it to on, it says you're using modules. When you set it to off, it says you're not using modules. But when you set it to auto, it used to be depending on whether you're inside of the go path or not, which was confusing. So now instead it works on uh, uh, whether we can find go.mod. And it looks for it in the current directory or any of the directories that are parent of the current one. This is kind of like the way it works for GoPath and Vendor and all that stuff, same mechanism. Uh, if you want to know how, whether you're inside of a uh, Go mod or not, you can actually use Go env Go mod, which is an environment variable, which tells you whether you found a Go.mod or not. And funny enough, uh, that also got like 10 times faster than the previous version, which means that now it actually works really well, even on your editor and stuff like that, which is nice. Uh, there's also this environment variable GoSumDB, uh, which defaults to sum.goland.org. The point of this variable is it allows, when you're downloading an, a package, if it's the second time you download it, you can actually check that it's the same one that you had because go.sum. But if you download it for the first time, you cannot verify that it is actually the thing that you're supposed to download. So sum.goland.org is a database that contains all of the hashes of for those packages that already exist, and you'll be able to verify that what you got is actually what other people have gotten in the past. Right? Uh, you can also disable it if you want to. There's also, so has anyone used GoNo proxy or GoNo somedb? Okay, so three, four people. <laughs> they're, now they're documented, luckily, which is good, but still they're somehow hard to use, in my opinion. GoNo proxy and GoNo somedb basically say, do not use the Go proxy for this because it doesn't, you will not find it there. So just go directly and clone it from whatever uh, HTTP or URL, whatever you got. GoSumDB is kind of the same, but do not verify it on GoSumDB. Just, do, just trust it, right? Uh, if you want to use that, which is very useful when you're downloading code from private repositories, for instance, uh, you had to set both. Now you can just set one, which is go private. So you can say go private my own uh, GitHub repo or my own GitHub organization, and it will just work. That's pretty nice. Also, there's go insecure. Do not use it. <laughs> unless you have to, but basically it stops from checking any certificates or HTTPS and it just downloads whatever. It is also great if you use it with GoNosOnDB, that way you don't verify anything too, that's great. Uh, <laughs> okay, so for everybody here using Subversion, now you can use it for, with Go modules, yay. Uh, okay, GoDoc h-http, uh, this is something that I'm slightly sad about. Uh, this is a joke about Midsummer if anyone gets it. But uh, godoc-htp went away. Dash-htp uh, would make godoc act as, a, an, as an HTTP server, so you could actually have the website locally, and even better, you could see the documentation, the way it's going to look on the website from your machine as you're typing, which was pretty cool. And I don't know how we're gonna replace that, but sad. But eventually, I think that something will be replaced. Hopefully, yes. Uh, cool, it's one new thing, which I didn't know what was before, so. Thank you. You explain. So we got a new uh, flag to the go build command. We now have go build dash shrimp pot. And what it does is if we run a normal go build and we trigger a stack trace, for example, with a panic, uh, we suddenly get uh, my home directory slash home user go source gitter blah, blah, blah. When, why do you want that? And then when we do go build dash shrimp pot, that whole part where I, where I store my go files is now replaced by the weirdly named command dash line dash arguments. So why would we do this? First of all, if you build something on a CI, you can now trim out all your real CI stuff and just have one part there. And also reproducible builds are now possible. This helps making reproducible builds that we can now compare binaries built on two machines that they are, my, that they are similar or, or identical. Back to you for the runtime. Cool, thank you. So uh, for runtime, there's uh, one little change that is not performance, the rest is just performance. So the little change, when you have an out of, uh, out of range, I was gonna say exception, error, uh, now it actually tells you more information. It tells you what was the length and what was the index that you tried to access. This is super good for beginners. So thank you, Go Team. This is actually uh, very good. Be before this, I would actually just like print the thing before it crashes, which is not sad. So this is very good. Uh, small change, but good. Then for performance, defer got, like defer has been getting, getting faster for quite a while. Like people still say, oh, do not use it. It's not, that, it's not that fast. It got faster and faster and faster. And now is for most cases as fast as calling a function, which is very fast. 
So uh, if you want to use it, you can literally use it anywhere. There's details on exactly what places it works and what places it really doesn't, but you can see that it went from 67 nanoseconds to 7 nanoseconds. And 7 nanoseconds is really fast, so you can use it literally anywhere. Uh, JSON also got much faster. I run this on uh, uh, my machine, well, uh, a cloud machine, 32 cores, uh, and encoding in JSON got 9% 9, 9 faster, and decoding got 38% faster. So all the things that you have, like serving uh, REST APIs and stuff like that, will benefit a lot from this, which is really nice to see. There's a lot of changes, but one of the changes is here. By the way, at the end, we'll have a link to the slides so you can download them if you want to. What else? A uh, bunch of things. <laughs> so uh, one of the things that we changed, because of SSA, we're able to do, uh, to verify whether check bounds are necessary more often or not. So there's a bunch of them that have been removed, so your code will be faster when you're using slices. Timer dot, time dot timer also got more efficient. Uh, and also when you're using mutexes, now when you, when you um, uh, unlock a mutex, and by unlocking it, you're releasing, you're making a go routine be schedulable, that routine will be scheduled directly, which means that on high contention, your programs will run much faster. Uh, if you don't know what that means, it's fine. Things faster with <laughs> concurrency. Uh, and ports, which I don't know anything. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> in just in case you don't know, Go runs everywhere. Go runs everywhere, except NACO. <laughs> So in 1.13, we have support for Android 10 in Go. I'm not sure who uses that. In 1.13, uh, macOS users now need 10 to 11 El Capitan or later. Uh, 1.14 will also be the last version to support Darwin ARM 32 bits. 32 bits, be careful. That's only used on iOS anyway. And on 1.14, we will now have a port for FreeBSD on ARM 64, which today we have a full talk about. And Go 114 might also support Dragonfly, Illumnas, and Solaris, depending on whether a build server at the Google team that works or not. And Go 1.13 uh, also drops support for the native client in favor of WebAssembly. And also, breaking news, TinyGo, not so tiny budgets. TinyGo is now officially sponsored by Google, and that's all we know for now. How many of you know about TinyGo? Whoa, uh, look back. Yeah. <laughs> That was Great. basically the whole room. Yeah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> On Windows, we also got some nice features. We got, finally got data execution prevention, which has been in Windows since Windows XP, but for some reason, Go never cared about it. So data execution prevention will mark specific regions in the memory as executable or non-executable, which is enforced by the CPU. And that's something you don't need to do anything about. It's automatic, automatic yes. so it just happens. And we also have improvement for Windows events. So when we listen for a syscall in, uh, in our Go program, Go will actually translate Windows events to syscalls. So we have now three new events, control uh, close, control log off, and control shutdown, are now translated to a SIG term in Unix terms when you use a Go program. And now for the community. So the women who go got seven more chapters than last year, which is makes that we now have 37 women who go and Joe Gobridge chapters in almost every part of the world. For the Go Developer Network, for those who don't know it yet, it's a meetup network that's uh, sponsored by Google of all Go meetups in the world. Now has over 10,000 members in 172 meetups, which hosted 4.6 thousand events. And to those events, 137 people RSVP'd yes. And this is a map of all meetups in the world. Go meetups. Cool. So conferences. for conferences, uh, there's a bunch of them. So uh, the first one is this one, Faustin. Hi. Uh, <laughs> the next one is tomorrow. And this is why uh, uh, we don't have Chris Nova here today, because she's flying to Israel to speak at that conference. Uh, talking about conferences that are very close together. So uh, between March 27th, 28th, 29th, and 30th, we have four different conferences in, I think, four different continents. Yay, uh, which makes it fun. <laughs> so if you like to travel, have fun. We have uh, Capital Go, Washington DC, Go for Con India and Goa, Go for Con Russia in Moscow, and Doug Go in Paris. Uh, and then uh, we have also Go for Con Europe in Berlin, which is probably uh, one of the ones that you can get closely here. Also, Doug Go is a very good conference, and it's not far, it's straight away. Uh, on top of that, 
I just wanted to show you this amazing drawing by Ashley McNamara and also the fact that we are all, well, I am going <laughs> to, <laughs> to GopherCon in Disney World Studios. Uh, so that's going to be fun. Uh, so I think it's probably the best venue I could imagine for a conference. Uh, I think I might go to some talk. Uh, <laughs> uh, and also, finally, one thing, it's the slides are here. So if you want to take a picture, this is the picture you want to take. I'll give you five seconds for the picture. <laughs> okay, so this is the end of our talk. Thank you very much. And yeah. yeah. <laughs> And uh, some more things is uh, today is actually the seventh year that we are here in a row. So I wanted to show you a little bit the evolution of the Go, of the Go Dev Room at Fosdem. This is in 20, back in 2014. I don't know if you can see there on the left. Well, this is a very tiny room to start with. It was on Building K. And uh, this day was incredibly hot inside and snowing outside. It was great. Uh, <laughs> Also there, that's uh, uh, the first co-organizer. I used to co-organize this with uh, Andrew Duran, and also Brad Fitz was giving a talk about a Camly store or something like that. Uh, then in 2015, we got the same room. You may notice there's a gopher drawn there. There's actually two, we keep on doing that. Uh, so in 2015, <laughs> we got that room. We complained a little bit. In 2016, we got a bigger room, and that was great, but still completely crowded. In 2017, we got the same room, and we complained. So in 2018, we got the same room. <laughs> and then we complained again and we made a video which I could not add in there, but we complained a lot and we got this amazing dev room which is much, much bigger. And this year, it's sad that all of you here got late because uh, this is the picture. <laughs> so, yeah, it's Sunday. So but anyway, uh, let's see what room we get next year. Uh, so uh, more things about today. Thank you. So we just seen the state of Go. It was his talk. Next up is Dylan. He's already standing there. Cool. So we have a day of amazing talks scheduled all day. We don't even take a break. And at the end of the day, at 4 p.m., we will have an hour of lightning talks. A lightning talk here is eight minutes. And you can still submit for a lightning talk. You go to bit.ly bit slash golight2020. And you can there still submit a lightning talk till 14.30 Brussels time, eight minutes. It's in this room. It starts at four. If you take more than eight minutes, we'll throw things at you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.